Okay. Good morning again. I think we might be up to Sunday, streaming Sunday 28, but I'm not sure. Um, and there's quite a bit of talk in the Victorian community about lockdown fatigue. And even those of us who appreciate that we absolutely, once we had the second wave, there was no choice but to do this. And that's not everyone, but it is most Victorians. Even we are just a bit tired, and um, we're not personally rushing to go out of the house after nine o'clock, but we would love to be able to travel further than five kilometers to see those of our loved ones who live outside that zone. But there are lots of lovely things happening, um, and I just, if there's time, I'm going to mention one and maybe just two things that have just, two little things, but have been really encouraging for us. Well, a third one really, and the, probably the main one is all the phone calls and emails we get encouraging us to just keep on doing what we're doing because different things help different people. And we appreciate that and we appreciate feedback about things we can do better. But one of our church members who's not on um, the internet, so she won't see this, rang last night. She rings most weeks to make sure we are traveling okay. She's a lot older than us. And she said she wanted us to call at the door this morning because we always put the leaflet in her mailbox on the way to church. So we called this morning and there she was with a pot of lemon curd, which sweet toothed as we are, we absolutely loved. And she had made it with lemons from her niece's tree. So she said, much more tasty than the ones you buy in the shop. And then we got here very early because we had a couple of calls we had to make on the way. And our neighbours on the south side, there was noise like cutting metal. And we th hoped it would stop by 11. Um, if not, I think I would have possibly slipped over. But you know, they're not so conscious. Well, we didn't think of the time on a Sunday morning because they're not church going. So about half past 10, Graham had a text to say, sorry about the noise, it will stop at 10.50. And this was without us thinking of them and we realized, without us having said anything, and we realized that on a Sunday, they think, ah oh, yeah, Graham and Christine are there and we don't want to disturb them. So. I'm sure you can all tell lots of little things that happened to encourage you this week. And I'm now going to hand over to Graham. Well, thank you, Christine, and, uh, and thank you to our neighbours uh, for uh, switching off their noise. That was lovely and thoughtful of them. And, and hello, and welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church and to our service this morning. Or wherever, whatever time it is, wherever you are, we uh, hope and pray that you will enjoy this uh, time together of uh, privilege that we have of worshipping God and reflecting upon his word and all that Christ means to us and to our community. So welcome to church. Christy mentioned that we had dropped off some copies of the leaflet. This is the weekly leaflet. It uh, is attached to the website and you can download it from there and it uh, contains a number of things. Think, um, we always have a country we pray for every week. This week it's Saudi Arabia. We have notes of the sermon so, because I'm not going to imagine you'll remember everything I say. Um, we have an outline of some things to pray for and some details about the church which are all available and the web, on the website. Um, we appreciate your comments and feedback. We thank you for that. Some of you are no comment on, on Facebook and, and others, uh, as Christine has said, phone in and uh, encourage us. And we're grateful for that. So we're going to begin our time of worship with prayer. So I'd like to invite you to join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be joined together via the Internet in an amazing way. We ask too that you'll connect us with each other by your spirit as our thoughts are guided by your word and as we bow before you. We ask you to receive us as your children for Jesus' sake 
and in his name we ask forgiveness. And we ask that you will unite us, not just with those who join into this service, but with all in every place who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus today. So accept our worship and we will seek to give you the praise and the glory in his name. Amen. We're going to begin with a short piece of music by Telemann. This is uh, Amanda playing the violin. I invite you to be still and to reflect on a time of worship together. Well, me again. Um, in these 28 weeks of streaming, so when I typed these notes, I must have been confident it was 28. We have referred to animals several times. Early on, um, I think it was Graham who spoke about sniffer dogs, which are used to used for so many purposes, including they've been used to sniff out COVID and apparently that research is still progressing, excuse me. I've also referred to the streaming of the Penguin Parade, which we've actually forgotten to watch this week and I think we'll get back into it because it is so relaxing. And the Peregrine, Peregrine Falcon Nest at 367 Collins Street and those chicks I think are due to hatch this week. So again, we must get back to look at them. At the moment, the ABC has a really beautiful series called Australia Remastered about Australian wildlife. It's called Remastered because it's digitally enhanced footage of Australian animals. 
Aaron Peterson, an Australian actor, very good Australian indigenous actor, does the commentary and then we feel he throws around the millions of years a bit loosely, but just for the sake of the footage, it is beautiful. And thanks to you, Amanda, on Friday night, we watched My Octopus Teacher on Netflix. Thanks to you, Andrew, we have Netflix and it really is a beautiful, beautiful program. Now, of course, you'd all be aware that the Bible has many references to animals and our responsibility towards them. When I was talking about this, Graham pointed out to me that um, when God told Noah to build the ark, it wasn't just for human beings. He had to bring in a pair of each species of animals to prevent, to save them from extinction as well as the human race. And many of us have known since our childhood, or well, certainly those of us in Presbyterian circles, but I think Anglican too, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. This was published by Cecil Francis Alexander in her Hymns for Children way back in 1848. Animals, of course, need protection, as do children and vulnerable adults. Sadly, there are many who would hurt animals for gain. For example, and this is a very publicized example, elephant hunters who hunt elephants to get the ivory from their tusks. Others, sadly, simply neglect their pets in their homes. As with many vulnerable creatures, it's often been charities who have first taken steps to protect them and ensure that perpetrators of cruelty or neglect are brought to justice. One organisation which certainly in Australia and in the UK is very well known is the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Recently I read, and I could not find the article again, bad filing on my part, that William Wilberforce was involved in the foundation of the RSPCA. Now I knew of his role in the abolition of slavery, but I had never heard about his involvement with animals. So went to, you know, the ubiquitous and usually accurate, usually accurate Wikipedia. So, and I have to read this carefully. The Reverend Arthur Broom, and you can look him up if you want to, wanted to create an organization to promote kindness towards animals. The first meeting was held on Wednesday the 16th of June, 1824, in Old Slaughter's Coffee House in London. Strange name. If you go to London, there is a plaque on the modern building there at 77 to 78 St. Martin's Lane, I think it is. You'll find this on the internet. And guess what? William Wilberforce, Wilberforce was at that meeting in a cafe which founded the SPCA, as it was called. Already in its first year, the society brought 64 offenders before the court, including a Mr. Bill Burns. Yes, and I was keen to see how clear this painting would be. This is the trial of Bill Burns, showing Richard Martin, another founding member, with the cruelly treated donkey in an astonished courtroom. And this led to the first, the world's first known conviction for animal cruelty because he had been found beating his donkey. So I thought that was an interesting piece of history. In Australia, and here's to you, Victoria, I'm because we're getting a lot of bad publicity, sometimes called the pariah state at the moment. Well, the first Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was formed here in Victoria 
in 1871. Now to jump forward to the 21st century, I went to the RSPCA website and on that you can find their manifesto. They believe that animals must be treated humanely and their manifesto still, um, spells out some, many in fact, of the implications of this belief. I contacted a young friend who works for the RSPCA in Burwood here in Melbourne and asked her how COVID has affected them. Of course, like all charities, they've had to cancel fundraising events and that's hard and is going to probably have a long-term effect. However, she said, our adoption rates have been fantastic. Lots of our pets have found homes during this time. Now you know that lost animals often end up at the RSPCA. So many of those have been adopted out. And I think we can all understand why. It's not for nothing that dogs are often called man's best friend. And in lockdown, so many people who live alone have realized that it would ease their loneliness to find a pet. Some people find cats more compatible with their personality and lifestyle than others' dogs. And as well as lonely adults, children who can't get to school and meet up with their friends, I think some of them have probably pressured parents into adopting an animal free to a good home. Of course, our responsibility towards animals in the 21st century cares well beyond caring for domestic pets and even farm animals, but I want to come back to the farm animals. I watched the French news one day this week. I wish I could make time to art watch it every day. And I didn't realize, to my shame, that many parts of France have been in drought for four years. And they had an interview with a young farmer, and if it wasn't for the language, he could have been a young Australian farmer, grieving because he could not feed his animals and was going to have to sell them at a very low price and hopefully sell them um, to someone who was living in a less drought-stricken part. But if we could just pop back to the photograph before this, one of the things that good farmers do is care for their farmers, their animals, even in drought. And so you hear, you see this farmer nursing a lamb and with all the sheep around him. And then if we move to the next one, those of you who are interested in agricultural science will probably be able to read out up about this. It's obviously some artificially cultivated grass, which is then laid out in strips for the animals to feed. And then the next photo shows more conventional feeding of, of animals in Australia, where the farmer or the grazier goes around and um, gives out dollops of food, and then the animals come for it. So that's all about the good looking after good care for animals but of course we now have the transport of live animals overseas a very contentious issue in Australia and as Christians we have a responsibility to ensure that as much as we can have an influence we do ensure that animals are treated humanely including those who we all know serve us by being the guinea pigs in experiments on medications. Now, if you type Bible verses on the care of animals into Google, you will find heaps. I think on one side I found a hundred. I just want to read two from Proverbs. One, a righteous man has regard for the life of his animals. That's Proverbs 12, 10. And 27 verse 23, Know well the conditions of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. So we're on solid biblical ground when we advocate for the care of animals. And that's probably why the Reverend Arthur Broom and William Wilberforce and others got involved in this almost 
200 years ago. So may those of us who have animals to care for do so with compassion and yes, delight. And may the rest of us support organisations like the RSPCA, knowing that not even one sparrow falls to the ground without God's knowledge. May he bless us and our animals. Thank you, Christine. Now we're going to hear from uh, Ian Rutherford. Ian's going to read the Bible for us, and the passage is part of Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. So over to you. Thank you, Ian. Good morning. The reading today is Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 24. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendants and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Did you do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum? Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. Here ends the reading. Well, thank you very much, Ian. We're taking our, this passage from Luke as our focus this morning, although I want to look at other ideas in chapter 4 as well. Um, let me just pray. Lord, I ask that... Uh, the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Luke is the only non-Jewish writer of the New Testament. In the 27 books that make up our New Testament, Luke is responsible for about 28%. That is Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts. And we're turning to that as we look at great texts from the Bible, Luke chapter 4. And in the passage which Ian has read, you heard Jesus say, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. So we've got the key idea in this verse is that Jesus has been anointed to proclaim the liberty and salvation of the Lord. So let's, let's go into that synagogue in Nazareth and pick up some ideas from the uh, reading that Jesus uh, read and what he said about it. I've got four things that I want to draw your attention to. The first thing is the idea of the reign of God. The second thing is the imperatives that come from the prophetic scriptures that Jesus is referring to. Uh, the third thing is the idea of the, the year of Jubilee. That might be a less than familiar but I hope you'll come to understand a little bit about it. And then I want to pick up on the idea of praise and glory. So first of all, the reign of God. Uh, and the uh, passage uh, in this poem that Jesus has picked out from Isaiah 61 uh, runs right through from earlier in Isaiah. And in chapter 52, uh, the, the prophet says the messenger is coming and the message is this, your God reigns. That's Isaiah 52 verse 7. Your God is king. 
Now, we might say, well, oh, look, hang on, we're looking at this verse here in Isaiah 61. Why do you refer to something in Isaiah 52? Well, I've, as I've said, in Hebrew, it's all one poem. So it's that passage that's in Jesus' mind. He's been handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And in, in those days, when people learned a passage, they, they didn't just learn a verse here and a verse there. Their whole education was about rote learning. They learned large tracts of scripture off by heart. I'll show you another passage that was obviously in Jesus' mind in a moment or two. But let's just bear this in mind that this would have been in Jesus' mind. I remember hearing a young, a brilliant, I may say, young man speaking uh, years ago in the 70s. And he was saying that when the New Testament quotes a verse or two from the Old Testament, you can be sure that the whole context is in the mind of the person who quotes it because of the way they learnt scripture. So your God is coming. He's, that's the prophet's message. And at the beginning of Luke's gospel, the message to Mary was, he will be king. He, this uh, this uh, child that you're expecting uh, is that you will have a child who will be king. In fact, the Lord God will make him a king. Luke chapter 1 verse 33. And, and, and in the, just after this passage, a little further on in chapter 4, Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom. So Jesus is moving forward with an imperative in his mind. The gospel concerns the reign of a king. And the ethical concerns of that king will shape the citizens of his kingdom. We might ask, what would we expect to see if God was king? Well, Nicky Gumbel, in, in uh, a reading that came into uh, our Bible readings this week, said that uh, it would be both audacious and revolutionary. And that's what we encounter as we read this passage. An audacious and revolutionary claim. And it comes from the prophetic imperatives. Let's go back then for a moment to what the prophet was saying in this passage of scripture that Jesus has quoted from. He's, he's saying that uh, there is a, a struggle for power in this world. Uh, in Jesus' own life, in the first part of chapter 4, Jesus is in the desert. You might recall the temptation of Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights. And it was a torrid time for him, a time of testing. And in this time, physically weakened, uh, the idea, the demonic ideas come to him. The devil, as it were, puts ideas into his head. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? You're hungry. And Jesus is uh, invited to use power that he has, presumably, to uh, change things. Um, one of my lockdown hobbies has become baking bread. Uh, it's a bit of a process, but gee, it's great when the, when, the, when the loaf comes out of the oven. And I just imagine what this must have been like, the very thought of bread at this time in his famished condition. But Jesus turns it down. He hasn't come to satisfy himself. He hasn't come to uh, seek for his, his own satisfaction. And then the, the uh, temptations flow on. What about uh, if I give you all, if you bow down to me and I give you power over all the nations of the earth? Raw, naked power. No, you're not the one to be worshipped. You're not the source uh, who shows us how power should be expressed. And then to the temple, cast yourselves down for hasn't God said that he will... He will uh, Send his angels to protect you so that you do not hurt yourself. And Jesus turns this away. He's not going to use power to achieve some spectacular outcome. And in each of these three temptations, Jesus draws on the scriptures that he knew as a boy. He grew up in Nazareth. This is where the scriptures are read. This is where the Jewish boys in the town were taught how to read. And they were taught to learn it off by heart, the way Jewish boys still do. And so Jesus knew the scriptures and he quotes Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. And he pushes the temptation aside. And now after ministering in the area, he comes back to Nazareth 
and he reads from Isaiah 61. And this is what it says. Let's just note one or two things about it. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen, says God? It's, uh, sorry, this is a couple of chapters earlier. This is the fasting section that precedes Isaiah 61. What is God looking for in the people that uh, want to serve him? Well, he says he wants the chains of the uh, injustice broken. He wants the... Uh, uh, cords of the, uh, of the yoke also broken. He wants oppression ended. He wants uh, the uh, hungry to be fed. Share your food with the hungry. He wants uh, the poor wanderer to be given shelter. Do we provide the poor wanderer with shelter? You know one of the aims in the White Horse Church's network is to provide a shelter in the winter for homeless people. N the naked, to clothe them and uh, not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. And so we are presented here with a, a whole series of things that this great poem from Isaiah says are important. And Jesus, uh, in reading from Isaiah 61, he says that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to achieve these things that Isaiah has been talking about. In his own inimitable way, Nicky Gumbel uh, draws five conclusions from this. The first is that Jesus' manifesto is about transforming lives. We can expect to see lives changed. Your life and my life as God comes alongside and implants in us his values and his ethical concerns. We can expect to see relationships changed because Jesus comes to bring reconciliation between uh, fighting people and warring parties. We can expect to see culture changed because this poem talks about rebuilding the ancient cities, the cities that God had for his people, the places of refuge and the city of peace, Jerusalem. These were to be rebuilt and become centers of culture because culture tends to flow from our cities. And they will effect the transforming of society and even the priests of your people will be changed. Now this, this prophetic imperative, what, what God's prophets are seeing as God's purpose for his world, uh, are not just unique to Isaiah. Um, you would have heard, perhaps if you're old enough, perhaps one of the best, certainly one of the most memorable speeches of the 20th century was... Uh, was when Dr. Martin Luther King spoke in 1963 uh, at the National Mall in America. Let justice roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. He was quoting from the prophet Amos. And how often have you heard the words of Micah quoted? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. There was a, the prison fellowship leaflet which came available this week has on the cover a man wearing a, a t-shirt with those words from Micah. These concerns of the prophets are the concerns of God. One of the um, beautiful pieces of uh, lettering in the Jerusalem, the uh, St. John's Bible, uh, that caught my eye is this one here. Um, uh, you may find it hard to read at first because it invites you to look closer and to, to read it carefully and make out what it says but to help you I've typed it out the alien who resides with you shall be as the citizen among you you shall love the alien as yourself for you were aliens in the land of Egypt I am the Lord your God Leviticus 19:34. so Jesus comes and announces the prophetic imperatives He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted and to gather in. Uh, so Jesus has come to be a servant. And this, this is the year of Jubilee, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Every seventh year in Israel, the land was to be given a year off and to lie fallow. And presumably other fields were to be planted. So that there was a cyclical uh, uh, just as the human beings were to have a day of rest every week, so the land was to be given rest every seventh year. And every seventh year, 
um, there was to be release for the captives. And every 49th year, seven sevens, the uh, debts were to be forgiven and slaves were to be set free. In the ancient world, it was a terrible thing to be a slave. But there was more than one kind of slavery. There was, of course, the slavery that came about as a result of war and tyranny and naked power. But in Israel, there was a kind of bonded labor. A person could fall into hard circumstances, and if their family were not able to help them, then, and you know from the story of the book of Ruth, how a family came to the aid, a, cl a near relative. Um, but there was also the gleaning that went on. The poor were, there were meant to be ways in which the poor could glean some kind of livelihood. But if that didn't happen, then uh, a person could, could say to somebody, I'll be a bonded laborer for you. I will work for you for a year if, you will help, if that will help me pay my debts and start to recover after, say, a drought. Christine referred to a drought and the kind of things that uh, impact people farming on the land. So if somebody did that, in Israel there was the provision that if the person you bonded yourself to was good to you, and you wanted to stay with them, you could. When the year came round to be set free, you could say, as it says in the Old Testament, I love my master, I will not go out free. And in that case, you would have your ear pierced and a marker put in your ear that you were a bonded servant to this family that had been so good to you. So there was a kind of bonded labor that was acceptable. And it was so different from the slavery that was imposed upon the uh, victims of war. So as Christians, we need to ask ourselves, uh, are the priorities of Jesus, these, this manifesto that he's unrolling before us from Isaiah, are they our priorities? The year of Jubilee is the year when God visits his people. It is the time of the Lord's favor, we are told. It is the 50th year. So in each person's lifetime, in a sense, there was to be a jubilee when this was celebrated. Now we know not at all how well it was celebrated in ancient Israel. It just might have been asking too much. We don't know. But here is Jesus saying that he's turned from the naked use of power, spectacle, and uh, and uh, celebrity to the path of the prophets, the path of service, the path of, path of bringing healing, recovery, encouragement, embrace to the poor and the needy of the land. This is his chosen way. This is the way God reveals how power should be used. You know, we live in, in a world where men find it hard to give up power. You only have to think about the men who head up countries uh, such as China, Russia, Turkey, uh, and other places who have held on to power and extended their hold on power. It's difficult. And it, it has an immense corrupting influence. But Jesus didn't hold on to that kind of power. He saw the power of service. And this was to be to the praise and glory of God. He turned from selfishness. He turned from the naked use of power and from spectacle. Power doesn't really reside in those places. It's danger and brutality. So as we think about this, we, we come to the key idea that drove the prophetic vision. And it's in this Hebrew word, the Hebrew word in English is pronounced chesed. Um, it's a fairly guttural language, and so the, the word is pronounced with a ch sound, but sometimes it's written in English just as chesed, H-E-S-E-D. But it's this word in Hebrew, and it is the pledged love of God. This is the love that drove the whole of the Old Testament, the love that speaks tenderly to Israel. How can I give you up, Israel? Despite your waywardness, despite again and again you've turned from me. It's a love that will not let you go, as our hymn puts it. 
It's God come to save his people. And when we see him on the cross, we're reminded that the inscription said, this is the king of the Jews. We know him as Emmanuel from, from Matthew's gospel. God come to serve. This is what his manifesto resulted in. And his praise and glory are the consequence. What do we mean by that? Well, Jesus served people uh, in order to bring worship and glory to God, not to, not to himself, although he was God uh, among us, God with us. The pledged self-giving love of God reveals his glory. It's not revealed in shows of power and spectacle. It's revealed in you and me if we embrace Jesus. And walk his way. It's hard. It means forsaking our own aspirations. Our own egos. And imagining others greater than ourselves. And, and it even imagines, as Christine was saying, that sort of compassion for, for other creatures. We see our creatureliness. And, and we recognize that they too are created beings. And here we are then, invited to have the glory of the Lord rise upon us. Another part of that same poem that uh, was referred to. The glory of the Lord rises upon you, uh, is the vision of Isaiah as he sees the work of the servant pursuing the uh, care of others. That was Jesus' manifesto. And you and I uh, discover as we find Jesus for ourselves that he brings joy into our lives. It's, a, it's the sort of cardinal thing in a Christian life. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Joy to the hearts of men and women. Not just, not just a superficial a smile or cheers, but something deep within uh, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote, uh, surprised by joy. That was the thing that he found that Christ brought to his life. And it brings thanksgiving. We should be giving thanks. It brings adoration, a God whom we adore and worship. It brings wonder because it, there's an awesome thing here that, uh, that service to others uh, should be the way that the almighty maker himself commits to our well-being. It brings worship and it brings praise, which is so characteristic of Christian worship and which we're finding so hard to do without as we're uh, not to uh, sing or spread uh, coronavirus these days. So we are challenged, but these things, this collection of words are all there in the poem that Jesus draws our attention to. And this is what he's encouraging us to embrace. That means there's a challenge here for us to mirror his concerns, to take seriously in our everyday lives in 21st century what it means to share good news, to bind up the brokenhearted, to share the good things of life with those who are denied them by one reason or another. There's a, a video on YouTube which I watched and it's about a homeless man who's playing a piano that's left in a public place. And he seems to be playing beautifully. He is playing beautifully. And somebody filmed it and talked to him and discovered that his wife had died and he'd uh, lost his child uh, through some circumstance or other and he'd become homeless and, and this was filmed and put on YouTube and later on there was such crowdfunding for him that uh, he, he was restored. <laughs> he had a haircut and he had new clothes and he looked a different person. And the, the gospel transforms people in that kind of way. It, it just changes everything. And uh, 
I decided not to show you the clip because it, it uh, had too much information packed into it. But the challenge for you and me is to be part of God's transforming uh, presence in the world and then the glory of the Lord will be seen in our land. May it be so for all of us. May we embrace this challenge and may the glory of the Lord be seen here and among us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you pursued the will of your Father as made clear in the Scriptures. At Nazareth, you knew the path marked out for the Anointed One, and you embraced the prophetic manifesto to bring healing, justice, liberty, hope, and joy. Until at Jerusalem on Calvary you died, we can barely comprehend that you so loved the world. Lord, as your disciples, we want to bring healing, justice, hope, and joy into our families and communities. Help us in our churches to encourage one another in this great enterprise. And as the challenge of discipleship increases, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to love others as you love us. We are distressed at the political argy-bargy that has emerged from the management of the pandemic. As we focus on the health and well-being of the community, help us all to find consensus in the balance that wisdom decrees. As numbers of infections in Victoria trend down, grant that wisdom guides our political decision makers and medical advisors so that tensions are diffused and greater harmony emerges in the broader community. Thank you that our Prime Minister has made such a clear statement to the UN that the development of a vaccine for COVID-19 should not be driven by profit nor sequestered for the rich and developed nations, but bring benefit to all nations. Thank you that so many vaccines have already reached stage three. Again, we commit to you those frontline workers, doctors and nurses, hospital and laboratory workers, police, paramedics, the ADF and numerous other volunteers, especially the many across the nations who have become infected as they served others. Grant healing, we pray. We are also concerned about the increase in domestic violence. Bring help into the lives of every stressed family. Thank you that many are discovering there is a role for, the, for other creatures to play in alleviating distress. As COVID-19 presents a second wave in many places, we ask that the things we have sought from you for ourselves will be blessed to all people, wherever they may live. Bring forth good government and wise counsel and improve public health and hygiene. We pray for children and their families in Melbourne, especially during the school holidays where five kilometre restriction creates frustration and difficulty. Help children to escape screen captivity and enjoy healthy, active, outdoor fun. Thank you for the beneficial companionship of dogs and cats and other family pets. Our hearts are heavy as we hear news reports of civil unrest, mounting tensions and violence in various places. Especially we remember the plight of the Uyghurs, Tibetans and Mongolians in China, the communities attacked repeatedly by Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab in Africa, and the brutal totalitarianism in Saudi Arabia. We pray that the mission of Jesus will impact all aspects of every nation. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift upon you the light of his countenance and give you peace.